and we I'm going to <coughs> I'm going to introduce the first uh, topic speaker as uh, a Danish architect, art designer, and conference organizer, and one of the sweetest people I know. In addition to her wisdom, sing the London Hatter 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 Danish names. <laughs> has been learning for 16 years and KP since 2011. Um, as part of the feminist group, again, the Danish... I can't say it, say it. <laughs> she's made a really important contribution to the Danish community and community is what she's going to be talking about today in her personal and political talk. So is this, this is on, yes. Growing up, I loved discussing ethics with my parents, especially my dad. I would ask him about right and wrong, and he would respond by asking me what I thought about it. We would discuss politics, cultures, conflicts, wars, human rights. And not once would my dad tell me what was right and what was wrong. Always he would ask me questions, opening up a dialogue, and giving me a chance to make up my own mind about the matter. I remember feeling really lucky that my parents valued my opinions and thoughts, even if I was only a child. My dad is a pediatrician. He works and treats especially very prematurely born children. And these children have been born several months before they were supposed to. They have parents who have been looking forward to seeing them, taking them home and loving them. And their lives are put on pause for months as their child is hospitalized. All my life, my dad has looked at these children and tried to figure out a way to help them the best way. Children who cannot communicate what is wrong with them, if they are in pain, or what they want from life. The thing about prematurely born children is that they have a much higher risk of getting illnesses uh, later on in life heart diseases, disabilities, and particularly cognitive disorders. And you don't know which children will get affected. So the doctors have to hope that what they do will be the best for the child. And sometimes they choose to stop the treatment. And sometimes the children just die. Every week, a child dies in that clinic. I watched my dad come home from work many times with a look on his face that clearly communicated that he had lost the battle that day. I've asked my dad, how he chooses whether or not to stop the treatment of a child. And he has this very simple question that he asks himself with every patient. Do I believe this child will come back later in life and thank me if I save its life? And if that answer is no, he will start considering ending the treatment and preparing the, the parents to let go. These are ethical considerations. Because you cannot know for sure how the future will look like, so you don't know what is the right thing to do for this particular patient. 10% of the children that they do save will get c severe cognitive disorders and some of them won't be able to take care of themselves growing up. So you have to ask yourself, what is the ethical thing to do? Therefore, my dad is also a member of a board that discuss ethics in pediatric care. And a few months ago, he came home from one of these board meetings. And one of the speakers had started his talk by saying, the greatest ethical challenge we face in the world today is that one billion people is living in poverty. And this is, of course, a surprising subject since they were there to discuss ethics in pediatric care. But this was a talk that really inspired my dad and moved my dad and that inspired a lot of discussions in my home. This is something that most people in this room are aware of. There is inequality and injustice in the world. Not only are we aware of this, but we care enough to actively discuss it and try to do something about it. We might be here to discuss LARP, but in many ways we are very political. The organizers of this Knudepunkt has, uh, has chosen to leave meat out of the menu to lower the carbon footprint of the conference, an initiative that clearly communicates something about our, the climate changes we are facing in the world today. Many people in, in this room will actively fight for every human being's right to be treated as equal. And I think that when we look ourselves as individuals or as a crowd in the mirror, we see ourselves as people who want to change the world and who believe that this is possible. And we take these discussions and battles from inclusion on Knudepunkt to slavery in Abu Dhabi. We fight for a better world. But this is where we sometimes get in trouble. 
We usually fight within our own ranks. We rarely listen to people we don't agree with, and we hardly ever question our own beliefs. If we look at the discussion about Abu Dhabi, I may, I'm sure that some, like most of you know that there was a discussion at this point. But if you don't know what the discussion was about, it was about whether or not it's okay to do LARP in a country that benefits from forced labor or who uses forced labor to work with LARP in particular. And this discussion arose because at the time there was a group of LARPers down there doing LARP at a water park for tourists. I believe it makes sense for us to discuss ethics and issues on human rights in LARP. But as many discussions in our community or in our crowd, this discussion became extremely aggressive and personal. It was actually more about the LARPers that were down there than about slavery in Abu Dhabi. These people were being pulled out on social media accused of being horrible people and benefiting from the slavery, and they were required to do a personal and public atonement. Some people argue that they should have been boycotted from this event so that we could clearly communicate that this is, these are actions that we will not stand for. Many people said that they should have been aware of this, that they could have just read an amnesty report. And maybe they should have been aware, and maybe they were actually aware. And maybe they could have just read a report. Let's look at the world we live in. Rewinding to the statement that the greatest ethical challenge we face in the world today is that one billion people is living in poverty. This is an ethical challenge and not just a humanitarian challenge because part of the reason why they live in poverty is because we live in wealth. We are rich because we are able to earn money from working, take those money, buy the products we need and still have money left. Money we can use to travel, to go to LARP, to come to Knudepunkt. And this is only possible because the people who produce the products that we need earns less than we do. So I'm able to, to go work for one hour and take the salary from that hour, buy a product of an, of an hour of labor from someone else and still have money left. So the price of the product that I buy is directly connected to the conditions those people work under. Maybe you feel it was irresponsible for the people to go to Abu Dhabi and LARP, or work with LARP. But you don't have to go to Abu Dhabi to be in contact with products who are, the, who are, the, who are made from forced labor. You can go into the breakfast buffet at the cereal table because Amnesty also just revealed a report that says that companies like Kellogg's and Nestle uses forced labor. You, you can ask yourself what kind of conditions the person who produced the cheap shirt that you bought in, in H&M work under or how many women and children have lost arms and legs in the factories in Bangladesh that produce the jeans that you bought for 400 krona. No one in this room can call someone out for having accidentally benefited from forced labor and not be guilty of that crime himself. It makes sense to be aware of the products we buy, and it makes sense to put pressure on the companies that, pr that pr or use this forced labor or whose working conditions are opposing basic human rights. But it doesn't make sense to go stand in the breakfast line waiting for someone to put a spoon down the cereal bowl and then attacking them for being horrible human beings. Just as I don't think it makes sense to make one of your friends break down crying on Facebook because you believe in the fight for human rights. I think one of the reasons why the tone gets so frustrated when we discuss things that frustrate us is because we stand with both a want and a need in these discussions. On one hand, on one hand, we want to bring arguments that will make our opponents see our side and understand our views. But on the other hand, we have all of these feelings, angers and frustrations on the subject that we feel the need to let out. But when we choose to go with our need to let out our frustration, that becomes an attack of the person who we are trying to make us, to make, a, to make us understand. Or. And when someone is attacked, the brain closes off tolerance and empathy for the attacker, so we stop listening. And the more aggressive that attack becomes, the less we listen. To bring an example, I've only organized Knudepunkt once. But in that process, I was compared to the civil or the extreme right movement Pegida, and I was accused of trying to kill my participants. This was, of course, not me personally being attacked. These were the organizing groups that I was a part of. And the people who wrote these things were probably just frustrated and trying to let that out. But by letting their frustrations out in this way, I felt attacked and accused of being a neo-Nazi and of trying to kill my participants. 
And knowing my own emotional response to this, I can say for sure that my empathy and tolerance for the people involved in these debates definitely took a hit. So when we choose to go with our frustrations, or our need to let out our frustrations, we risk to close the exact door that we are trying to enter with our arguments. The consequence of this way of talking to each other, as I see it, are two things we are definitely not interested in. One, we use up our organizers. By giving them so severe hate whenever they make a mistake, or whenever we don't agree with their design choices, we make sure that fewer and fewer people will want to organize for this crowd. Or maybe they simply don't dare, because they're afraid that they will get attacked if they make a mistake, or when they make a mistake. And they probably will get attacked. I know several people who doesn't even want to participate in Knudepunkt anymore, and some of them I'm organized Knudepunkt with. Secondly, by not showing tolerance for the people we discuss with, we use up the tolerance that they feel for us. We are always talking about inclusion, tolerance, and space for diversity, but we fight for these values by not tolerating people we don't agree with, or by threatening to exclude them from the, from the event. I truly believe that if we want a tolerant, inclusive, and caring culture at Knudepunkt, we have to meet each other with tolerance, inclusion, and care when we discuss this culture. If we choose the methods of anger, judgment, and exclusion, that is the culture we will get. We need to learn how to listen. We've never had so many channels to hear each other on, and so few people are listening out there. A phrase which has become very common in the groups online, which I think kind of sums up the culture that we discuss in, is, can we please talk about the fact? And this is a phrase that provokes a lot of people. And when you listen to the words, it makes sense that they are provoked. Can we please talk? Are words that invite a dialogue. But then we add about the fact. And the word that I have a problem with in this context is the word fact. Because that word is something we use to describe something that we have already agreed upon to be true. We don't discuss facts. And we don't think that they will change if we go into a dialogue about them. So why are we inviting dialogues about things that we don't question? And when you go through these debates online, you realize that maybe these were never supposed to be a dialogue, because this seems more like a public scolding of the people who will dare to question the stated fact. I've seen discussions online where the person who started the discussion responded to every opposing argument with, yeah, I seriously doubt that. If we are not going to listen, what is the point of talking? I was brought up to seek answers through reflection, by asking myself the tough question, and my, by going into a dialogue with those around me. And I truly believe that if we don't dare questioning our own beliefs, if we don't dare listen to our opponents, and for a minute see their side, we will at best only get half-truths. The world has changed a lot lately. It has changed, it seems like, since I signed up to do this talk. And we probably already always hated each other online, or were mean to each other. And accusing each other of everything that is, going, that is wrong with this world. But now we live in a world where our politicians are building walls, closing borders and exiting unions. Martin Nielsen said in his speech for the summer school last summer, that when our politicians build walls, we should build bridges. And I think this is true, but I also think that this is something we simply cannot afford not to do. We can stay angry and frustrated, hating each other online, accusing each other of everything that is wrong with this world. We can boycott those that we don't agree with, or threaten to exclude the people whose values we feel will threaten our values. But if we do this, I don't see how we are different from the politicians that are, close, that are currently closing off their borders to protect their values, and making the divide between people who are different wider. We can go out into the world, meet people who doesn't share our values. We can create stories through LARPs. And through those stories, we can move people and affect their opinions, creating, creating bridges across borders, ideologies, and cultures. And I feel that could be a revolution. Even if you have no plan on going out into the world or creating LARPs or of conferences for people that you don't agree with. If there's only one thing you should take from this talk, it should be this. How we meet the people around us shape the, shape the culture or community that we share. 
We build tolerance through tolerance. We build inclusion by being inclusive. This world is filled with inequality and injustice, but I'm not going to tell you to check your privileges. I'm tired of talking about what we can say or what we shouldn't do. I want to talk about what we are going to do, and I want to ask you how you will use your privileges to make this world a better place. And on that mission to create a better world, we should ask ourselves, do I believe this child will come back later and thank me? No matter what we are doing, if that is organizing a conference or writing a comment on Facebook, we should ask ourselves, do I think this will bring value to the people that it will affect? And if that answer is yes, we need to be willing to see those 10% that will go wrong. We don't know how the future looks like. We don't know what will happen. So there is no clear right or wrong. There is no black and white because nothing important in life is easy. At the end of the day, we just have to hope that what we created or organized or anything created more goodness than harm in this world. But if we create a culture where people don't organize and don't act because they're afraid that they will get attacked for their mistakes, we will change nothing. Thank you.